Well, uh, welcome everybody. I'm just um, doing this Zoom recording for the first time. Um, and this is a recording of the, the Real New Year workshop. So last night in both clinics, Dr. Ashley and myself at, um, at Gambia and myself at Goodwood, we ran this um, audio and we had a lovely group of people, but we decided to do an online recording for the very many people who said they really wanted to come and listen to what we had to share, but they simply couldn't get there. So uh, forgive me in advance, this is the first time I've run a Zoom meeting with me at the helm, even though I've participated in the many. So I'll do my best to work my way through the technology to speak to you and to show you the slides of the PowerPoint presentation as we go along. So thank you very much for showing some interest, first of all. You might wonder why we're doing the real new year. So I'll just show you the headline of the real new year. Hopefully that you can see that on your um, screen. So we know that uh, at um, the new year, January the 1st on New Year's Eve, many people start to make goals. They want to start to make resolutions and make a change towards their health. Sorry, just trying to get the, get the uh, screen right for you. Hopefully this is right. So uh, a quick, quick question is, are New Year's resolutions uh, for real or are they maybe just a little bit of BS? Quite often we will start a New Year's resolution and with very good intentions. Um, we have great hopes and dreams for what we might achieve in the next year that's forthcoming. Uh, reflecting on our year before and decide, yep, this time we're gonna, we're gonna do something different. We're gonna make a change. So with great intentions, we might start in January and unfortunately, it may not all go to plan. Sometimes our um, resolutions might be very generalised. We haven't sort of got a very clear picture of what they are. Sometimes they might be just a bit of a novelty. We might be around other people who are also saying, oh, I'm gonna do this, or I'm gonna do that. We might feel pressured into saying that we must make a New Year's resolution as well. Um, and in that way, it's not necessarily very thought through. I'm gonna lose weight, I'm gonna run a marathon, whatever it happens to be. Um, and in the case of running a marathon, that might be a, uh, a resolution that might be just a little bit unrealistic. It's not impossible, but it's a pretty big task, particularly if you haven't really been into doing much running before. Having said all that, uh, we do know that over time, over time, people do seem to unwind and they might get to the end of January, beginning of February, hence why we're having this workshop in February, and find that the wheels have just completely fallen off. I know I've been in that situation, you may have been in that situation yourself. And um, when we say maybe New Year's resolutions are BS, I had this discussion with one of my clients just recently who said, look, I really don't believe in them. And she said that, you know, it doesn't have to be a new year. And I thought, you know, she's absolutely right. We can choose to make change at any time in our lives. It doesn't just have to coincide with the beginning of a new year. So let's look at this a little further. Just swapping over, swapping over so you can see the next slide. Why do we become unstuck so quickly? Let's, let's work through that for a little while. It has been shown that over 90% of people fail to keep their resolutions. And it takes anywhere between 18 to 254 days. We could put that in different terms, anywhere between three weeks and three months to actually create a new habit with the average of being um, average being at least a couple of months to create new habits and so that sort of seems like quite an effort I've often heard about the 21 day rule you might have heard yourself and creating new habits sometimes is might be a little bit easier than dropping old ones in fact a quote here from a neuroscientist which is it's much easier to start doing something than to stop doing something habitual without some sort of replacement behavior and on the back of that um, many years ago actually maybe not so many years ago probably within the last decade the government um, health organization they just started to do a, a health promotion campaign which was called swap don't stop you might remember they had some sort of rubbery figures, balloon figures who were demonstrating different things they might be doing to not completely give away behaviours, but swap them to better ones. And, you know, that's certainly a very valid way of doing it. Um, I did later read some research that really that they found that that campaign wasn't particularly effective. What they were trying to do was to address um, obesity in our wider population, because as many of you know, that is a problem. 
So I don't know what the government decided to do next. They've um, you know, spent money on a, on a big campaign and perhaps didn't get anywhere. Now, something you may not know about me is um, before my twins were born, I completed a graduate certificate in health promotion. Now, the reason I did that is I was involved in designing a um, spinal health program for primary school students in um, earlier this um, century, so in the early 2000s, and I ran a national program with a program manager for the Chiropractors Association for about five years. So out of that, I did further training because I wanted to be able to learn more and actually teach some of those skills to my peers. But in doing this health promotion um, graduate certificate, I learned that health promotion is a whole profession and entity separate. Now, whilst I am a health practitioner and I promote healthy things, I hadn't actually trained in health promotion. And there's a lot to be said about the knowledge around that. Unfortunately, governments don't tend to put a lot of money into health promotion. They tend to put more money into crisis care. Um, but really, um, we have to start from the, the foundation and that's where health promotion comes from. One of the things I learned along that journey was there's, a, there's an activity that we used to do and my sister was the co-consultant in this program. And when we were training people, we used to talk about doing a values walk. And we used to talk about two sides of the equation. One is having the knowledge and the other one is doing the behavior. So the question for you, does having the knowledge about a certain thing equal therefore doing the behavior? I wonder what you think. When I was doing this workshop the other night, I asked the room um, and actually every single person said, no, they don't think that having the knowledge is doing the behavior and they cited various examples. So one example I could give you is that we know uh, very surely that smoking is not good for our health. And you know what, probably almost everyone in our population knows that it's not good for your health. However, that doesn't equal the behavior. There's still a fair population of people that still smoke. And there's a whole swag of reasons for that. We know that speeding is a, an increased chance of having a problem and having a crash and a fatality, but people still speed. Similarly, people still use their phones in the car. Similarly, people might uh, drive longer than what they need to and fatigue can be a result of, um, um, can create accidents as well. So the concept of just because we know this stuff doesn't mean we'll do it. Well, not always. And I suppose um, one of the things we wanted to look at is, so why does that actually happen? So let's delve a little deeper and we'll go to the next slide. So one of the things I think is essential uh, in being successful is actually truly understanding why you want to make change. Um, and this might be very personal for you, but why do you want to make that change? What does it mean to you? And, in, and you have to be really honest with yourself and it might be a bit of a private conversation. Any of those of you who may have been involved in sales or corporate stuff, you might be aware of very famous uh, TED talk by Simon Sinek, and he, uh, Sinek, sorry, and he talks about start with why. Now, that particular talk is used in the context for companies selling products or services, um, and he explains that it's very important to look at your reasons and your rationale behind doing it before you start to push things out. Um, but there's a few different ways of, of looking at that, and we could look at our own personal behaviour. So Berkman, who's a neuroscientist, says that people who want to keep their habit for reasons that align with their personal values will change their behaviour faster than people who are doing it for external reasons. So let me just uh, swap screens again. So let's, let's sort of investigate that a little bit further. What are the things that really light the fire in the belly? It's going to be different for each one of us. So I'm going to give you a bit of example of something uh, that went for me last year. So um, over the years, I have done some damage to my knees. They're functional, but they are a little bit floppy and they're a little bit unstable at times. And sometimes they do keep me some trouble. However, one of the deep loves of my active life is to go snow skiing. And I was lucky to be able to do that as a a young person, I've done it a number of times through my adult life, but I hadn't been for some time and I kept a promise to my children and myself. I put a little bit of money aside that last year I wanted to take the family on a, on a ski trip. However, as uh, the first part of the year came around, 
my knees were troubling me. I was trying to do some training and I wasn't, um, wasn't entirely certain how they would go. So it got to about May and I thought, no, I really do need some help. I really want to enjoy my ski trip at the end of July. Um, and while my uh, family had their own, you know, needs and wants, I knew I needed to try and address what was going on with my knees. So I made a promise to myself that I needed to get some help with extra training. So I enrolled in a, um, a local fitness program. I checked it out. I thought, yep, this is the one. I found that they were um, able to push me a bit more than I could push myself. And slowly, slowly over that three months, I got to the point that I felt like I had a bit more strength and stability in my knees. I went skiing, my knees survived. I was cautious, I was an idiot, and actually really had a very lovely time. So that was one of the first things that I really, really wanted this holiday to go skiing and enjoy myself. So that was my little fire in the belly. The other part of that is um, the organization I was working with, I was training with, they started to promote that they were doing a particular challenge. And the challenge was gonna start at the end of my holiday. Um, and it was all about really trying to change some habits. And the other thing that I, I knew, apart from my knee issue, uh, was that my work pants had got progressively tighter and I wasn't too impressed with myself about this. And I was dithering and dithering about, you know, having to change some habits to really address that. I was probably putting in a half past effort. And I thought, no, I really needed to honour this commitment to myself and see if I could make a change. Um, because I was very aware that um, your waist circumference if it grows, it's a very strong indicator of future um, diabetes as an adult. And uh, adult onset diabetes is um, quite a distressing condition. Not many people really appreciate how much it can adversely affect so many systems in your body until they go through it and then they find out. Uh, having looked after many people over the years who've suffered with that and there's some family history, I certainly didn't want to put myself in that camp. Um, at that time, I was 45, going on 46 last year, and I realised that if I didn't address this little truth with myself that I was probably going to find it harder. So that was my fire in my belly and I launched myself into this challenge, but I really needed to get my why in, um, in a good state. So let's just flip again so I can go to my next slide. One of the things that I think makes a difference in the success, and this is what happened for me certainly last year, I've reflected a lot on it, is having a support group around you. Um, and when Ashley and I were putting this talk together, we sort of went through the various levels. And this was a slide that she um, came across. She was a bit, a bit of a Twitter girl. And she found this tweet from BrainChat, which is a, a, a neuroscience organisation. The concept of plasticity, we, we need to know that our brains are actually mouldable. We know that in our youth they're quite mouldable, but we sort of forget that as in our adult lives, we also have the ability to reprogram how we think or the way we do things, but it does take a little bit of effort. So we have this plasticity in our brain, but to lay down different thought patterns needs a bit of help. And what this little quote tweet says is that plasticity is more likely to occur when there's stimulation of the neural system, meaning the brain must be active to adapt. Changes do not occur without an exposure to a stimulating environment that makes the, uh, prompts the brain to work. So as a chiropractor, one of the things we, we do in adjusting people and adjusting spines is you forget sometimes it's not just the effect on the spine or the joint we're actually adjusting, that actually stimulates your central nervous system. And it's the messages that go back into your central nervous system that then reprogram the messages that go down and out back to your body again. So a, a thing about being adjusted is that your brain is stimulated in preparation for change. The other thing is we need to have a positive environment around us. So you kind of need a bit of a support crew. And certainly what I found is the environment that I was doing the extra training in, um, it, it, was, it was, I was training myself and the competition with myself, but I was around other people who were also working at their own goals and at all sorts of different levels of their fitness. So the whole uh, herd mentality or the group mentality can be incredibly powerful in helping you reinforce your reason of why and prompting you to keep going. So when I was doing this challenge, while the rest of my household wasn't doing it, I did ask the people around me to say, look, I'm trying to make a few changes. I know I'm not gonna be finding it really easy, but I'd just like you to back me up and support me a little bit of that and just encourage me along. So that's my other tip for when you're really trying hard to make change. Tell someone else, it makes yourself um, and someone else aware and it, it gives them a chance. And you know, most of the time you're gonna find people will respond really positively to that. 
So let's now talk about our SMART goals. So our SMART goals, well, they're one that um, you may also have heard um, in uh, the corporate world or if you've been in business, it's uh, very well known, but um, as you can see, I've sort of lengthened that um, an acronym. So SMART um, starts with specific. You need to be very clear about what you're doing. So if I use myself as an example, I really wanted to have my waist size decrease a little bit. I um, embrace my body. I know my body is a certain shape genetically um, and when it's healthier, it probably looks better when it's not healthier. Putting the aesthetics aside, that waist measurement was one I wanted to regain so I didn't have to buy elasticized pants and buy bigger pants and I could just wear my normal work pants that I was used to using for so many years and happy with that. So that was my specific thing, just like my knees being able to cope with the trauma and the bounciness of, of snow skis. So you need to really think about what does that specific thing mean to you? What does it allow you to do that you perhaps can't do before that really locks into your heart? M, measurable. So a waist measurement is measurable and there's all sorts of ways that we can record where we're at. Um, I remember one of, my, um, one of my former coaches taught me that record keepers are record breakers. So if you've got no way of ascertaining where you're currently at and sort of setting a baseline, you don't know whether you're actually making any change. Our feelings can fluctuate during that time, but you need to have some concrete data so that you can reflect on yourself and say, yeah, is that actually heading the direction I want to do? Now, we're really lucky here in this clinic. We have the fabulous Lisa Scarfo, who is a resident naturopath. And Lisa's been running her business from within mind for many years. Um, and she has technology that is, um, allows you to analyse the tissues of your body. It's called BLA. And so it actually does give you a measurement of your physiology, where your cellular fluid is at, whether it's inside or outside your cell, because there's an ideal ratio. It looks at your um, energy angles, your phase angles. Do not ask me to explain it because that's Lisa's technology. It does look at your lean muscle mass and it does look at your body fat ratio. And so that is a, a more detailed way of looking at your body health. Some people jump on the scales. Scales really don't tell us the whole story. Um, and it's really easy to get caught up with scales and, because they actually fluctuate quite a lot and they don't tell us the composition of our body. But that's where, if given a choice, I think measurements are actually far more uh, a better guideline than, than just the scales because that represents shape change and often when our body is changing in its um, fat ratio to its muscle ratio, you will actually get shape change. And your shape is genetically determined somewhat as well because of the shape of your parents and so on and so forth. So let's move on. So S, M, A. Um, the A is usually achievable. And achievable means, well, let's, let's sort of be realistic about where you're at and what you actually want to do. You could have some amazing goals, but you might need to be patient with your body to achieve that. And you, uh, um, it also means that you need to be prepared to get the help to achieve those goals. Some people do amazing things all by themselves as an island, but most people need other support information around them to actually make change. And then set them achievable so you actually can hit them and then celebrate your win because that's more likely to back you up to keep going. So keep it within that range as well. Now, the extra A I've added is accountability. And accountability I think is a really big one because you can make all these things within yourself and um, you know, life happens, stuff does get in the way, um, all sorts of traumas or unexpected things can happen and the priority for you and your goal might just really go to the bottom of the list. Having said that, if you have the ability to be accountable to yourself and you can do that by, by recording um, or you can do it by reporting to people close to you who might be that part of your support crew that you can be also accountable to them. I suppose ultimately the person that is most important is that person that you see in the mirror, that you can be happy when you look at yourself in the mirror and brush your teeth and you know that you are, you're being accountable to self and keeping your own promises. So there's lots of tools you can use for accountability as well. 
I got myself a Fitbit watch last year. They've certainly come down to uh, a price that is much more reasonable compared to when they first came out. Technology is better. So I love the fact that I can actually know what my steps are and I can know what my heart rate is doing. I can monitor my weight if I want to. I can monitor my sleep. But even in its simplistic form, you know, just your phone and, you know, almost everyone has a phone, that has the ability to actually track your steps and stuff like that. So there's lots of different little tools or you can buy separate heart rate monitors to sort of keep your accountability in check. Okay, so next one, let's just flip sides. Let's go back to the slide for a moment. Oh, where have I gone? Okay, so hopefully I'm still here. I just lost the technology for a moment. Let's see how we go. So we were talking about smart goals and I was just wanting to flick to my other screen. I think I might have accidentally lost you for a moment as I did that. So back to the screen. Oh dear. Here we go. Relevant. Let's make our goals relevant. Let's make sure that they actually mean something that's going to make a change in your life. Um, and that, um, that can be that it is about your health, for example. Um, it, your goals may not always just be about your health. It, it may be about the fact that you find yourself to be chronically tired all the time. Um, and you want to change things so that you don't feel tired and you feel you've got the energy to get through your day. It might be that you've been under a lot of duress or there's a lot of emotional stress in your life and you want to find a way that you learn to cope better with that or to try and deal with those things that are just making life so, um, so difficult. And the final one is T. And with T, we want to make sure that is time-based. So with time-based, my goals last year were I had three months to get my knees in order. And when I joined the challenge that I did, it was actually an eight-week program. But as I was going through that, I realised that this was probably going to be about a goal for a good 12 months before I was slowly, slowly able to address some of the areas and lose a few bad habits and actually create a new, a few more new habits. And the biggest thing was about me being able to sustain those new habits and embrace them as a new normal. So there you are, a different take on SMART goals with respect to your health. So now let's get into some other things. We want to talk about what we think needs to happen when I say we, I mean Ashley and I, about trying to address the various pillars of our health. And so I'll just give you this little, little picture here. So four pillars of health. Now I've just drawn a table um, because I wanted to use that as an example. We know that we need to eat well, we need to move well, we need to think well, and we need to recover and sleep well. Now, um, tables, well, they can actually stand beautifully and strongly with four legs. They probably can stand with just three legs. There are three-legged tables out there. But if you've got a square table with three legs, if you load stuff on the top, if you've got a lot of stuff going on, there comes a point where that will topple and things might start to fall apart. Certainly, a table can't stand with two legs and one, well, that's just about hopeless. So four legs, four pillars, Four pillars of health sounds better than the four legs of health. So that's why we've got this analogy. So I'm now going to talk through the various aspects of the four pillars of health. Just let me stop for a bit of a water for the moment. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about eating. So food, it is a massive, massive topic. And people really think about food in lots of different ways. Too much, not enough. Too much of a good thing, not enough of a good thing, too many bad things, and all the various impacts it has on us. I would like to know, do you actually love food? Do you love preparing food? Is it your job? Is it that thing that, are you the person in the household that actually takes responsibility for most of the prep in the household? Is it something you maybe don't love so much? Is it a chore? Are you the one that, oh my God, what am I gonna get ready for dinner? I have to think ahead. Are you under, under pressure to try and get it ready at a certain time? That person who does that in that whole household quite often will get to a point that it's not so much fun anymore. There might be a routine with the certain things they do. So that can create negativity around food. 
I also want to know, do you actually see it as a fuel source? Is it something that you perceive that, right, well, I've just got to get stuff into me and I've got to get in as quick as I can and have you ever found yourself just hoovering something down because you know you've got to eat something but you're so busy because you've got so many other things you need to do? Would you consider that food um, could be a medicine for you? Food itself is... Let's talk about fruit and vegetables for a while. I remember learning many years ago that, you know, your beautiful fruit and vegetables that ripen on the vine, for example, let's take a tomato, that flavonoids are a thing that emerges in that tomato in only the last few days of ripening. And they are an extremely strong antioxidant. So when we talk about food as a medicine, having the freshest, most flavonoid filled tomatoes are going to be the best tomatoes as a medicine for your body, as an example because we know that antioxidants are a really important part of boosting our immune system, for example. The other thing about food is that, is it determined by time and money? And for many of people, many people it will be. Uh, someone brought up in my workshop last night that the, the advent of Uber Eats had completely changed things for them, but um, maybe not necessarily in a good way. And someone else said, well, in my family, we've got a number of children, so budget-wise, that's just not an option. So yeah, I do have to do the preparation, but I'm always feeling under the pump for time to be able to do enough food preparation. And so I find myself sometimes throwing things together that may not always be ideal. So if there are some of these feelings that you might have around food, maybe, just maybe, it's a time to start to reframe it. So let's start to think about food in a different way. Food is nutrients. Food is a beautiful way of actually giving a source of our body for growth. Now, um, in, in the room last night, I had two ladies in here who were mothers to multiple births. I had someone who was in the room who was a mother of triplets, someone else who's her mother of twins. I was also a mother of twins. And I said to them, I said, did you kind of marvel how the hell did your body actually make not just one baby, but two babies? And how did that all work? And certainly for any person who, any mum who has had a pregnancy, they may well have experienced a certain amount of nausea or discomfort through the pregnancy. And what happens is that tiny little being that's growing inside of you will get everything of the nutrients it can possibly find in your body, but it can leave you lagging. And sometimes that can be a reason why mums actually have some nausea or in sometimes they have dreadful, dreadful morning sickness that is an all day sickness that lasts throughout. So nutrients is a really important part in pregnancy, let alone in our normal growth and development to make sure that our cells get the things they need. Reframing food again, it is the building blocks of matter that all our cells depend on certain things to build. And if we don't have certain ingredients, if we're nutritionally deficient, well, that actually changes formulation of cells and how they develop. And long term, that can, or that can create all sorts of health issues. Food, of course, is our energy. It is the source that we need to keep us going through the day. And if we look at timing of food, you know, breakfast is about breaking the fast. We haven't had anything for a period of time. We need something to get ourselves going. There's a lot of people who actually start the day and they don't have any breakfast at all and they might just, oh, I can't face it, and then they might have lunch. And there's some people who are just so busy they skip their lunch and then they're having their biggest meal at the end of the day. Now, we know that um, uh, from Lisa's perspective, she would say that is just the most awful thing um, ever to be having the biggest, most chunkiest meal at the end of the day, only eating once a day. Now, I'm not commenting here on anything about intermittent fasting. I have no opinion on that. I haven't actually asked Lisa's opinion on intermittent fasting. I'm sure there's a time and a place for it, but we're looking at your standard eating. So the other thing about um, food is to sort of rediscover the joy with food and the colour. And I'm sort of lucky because I, I have a husband who um, actually really enjoys cooking. And in my household, I was always home um, from the clinic probably later. And even when before we had children living with us, he was the one who often did a bit of the food preparation. I love cooking, but I don't get in there quite so much anymore. And particularly since the advent of MasterChef Australia came into our lives over a decade ago, oh my God, that has just changed Trevor's world. So I affectionately refer to him as MasterChef because he is just his... Cooking has just gone from one level to another and he loves doing all sorts of beautiful gourmet things. It's not always great for the household food budget, I will admit, but at the same time, we eat some really beautiful stuff, sometimes some naughty stuff as well, and that's where we need to bring that nutritional awareness. The other thing about food that I wanted to point out is who can think of a really important family celebration that perhaps doesn't involve food? 
most celebrations in our life involve some sort of food. When we, when we meet people, we might see an old friend, that we might be doing that for lunch or for dinner. So very rarely do we not have food around us. And we don't have to be negative about food. We can actually really embrace it. And one of the really important things to know that if you actually are eating well most of the time, those occasional naughty things that you might have, the fabulous cakes and desserts that can be made, and they're quite amazing creations at times, a little bit of that is okay, but of course you can't have that as the dominant feature of your diet. So Lisa has um, contributed to this uh, workshop, uh, and the next couple of slides in particular, she gives us some absolute gold of things to think about, the kind of foods to put into our system, and the kind of ratios of or how we should actually think about each meal. So I'm now gonna to flick to um, sharing the screen again. Hopefully I'm getting better at this. Now we're gonna talk about whole food. So I know it's a bit of a known brand, it isn't food whole. Well, you know, this is the difference between whole food and processed food. And I was talking about this with one of my clients just recently, and I mentioned it to Lisa. And he was saying that he was recently watching uh, someone on Instagram and it inspired him to make some changes with his food. And he said, you know, Paula, he said, there's, there's now aisles in the supermarket that I just don't go down anymore. And, and they're the aisles that have all the processed food on it. There's probably only three aisles I now go into. And I thought, wow, the supermarket gurus would just hate that because the whole, there's a science around supermarkets about how they market and promote and have things place to drag us down every aisle and pay attention to every end and, and do a lot of impulse buy. But if you notice in supermarkets, and I was discussing with Lisa that, you know, all the fresh stuff is kind of around the outside because it needs refrigeration or it might need freezer. That's not so fresh, that's frozen food, of course. And most of the other stuff is sort of staggered in the middle. So next time you go to your supermarket, pay attention. What route do you take? Do you actually need to go down every aisle for all the things on your list? Or are there some things that, you know what, I'm actually not going to buy them anymore. Speaking in our workshop last night, we had one mum said, you know, I've got to the point that I just, there's some things I just don't buy because if I have them in the cupboard, my kids will just go to that as a snack. And she said, because I'm not doing that so much anymore, they actually have to think about making something different. They might have to grab a piece of fruit or make themselves a toasted sandwich in addition, instead of them just grabbing some crisp or something that's, you know, calorie high and very nutritionally low. So she said, that's actually been a really useful strategy in my household. They're probably not very happy with me, but too bad. So let's now talk about food. So plant-based food. And Lisa would say, ev evolutionary wise, we are actually designed to have a lot more plant-based food than many of us have in our diets. Um, having said that, we do need to have protein. Now, I'm not gonna have a discussion about uh, people who are vegetarian or people who are vegan, that's not the point of this talk. People can make those conscious choices themselves. But if you're going to have animal products, let's think about how much you're having, how much meat and dairy you're having, or the variety of meat and dairy products that you might be having. There's um, lots and lots of non-animal protein, and uh, we're actually uh, running a program, which I'll tell you about at the end of the webinar, um, that will teach you a lot more about alternative sources to protein and, and how you can integrate that more into your diet as well. Um, as I mentioned before, processed food, so minimal processing as unrefined as possible. And so thinking about what that means is thinking about whole grains, thinking about brown rice rather than wheat rice, um, thinking about legumes, and while fresh, of course, is ideal and they often come in a dried form, Lisa has no problem with getting your cannellini beans in a can or your red kidney beans in a can or, or, or cooked lentils and making sure that you've got that in your pantry. Obviously, fruit and vegetables is whole food. Nuts and seeds. And seeds are a really excellent sneaky one that you can slip into salads and not really realise. So I'm just going to keep on the screen and now look at our ideal meal. So if you imagine a plate of food, a green plate in front of us, this is how Lisa would love you to break it down. She would love you to have half of that plate be two heaped handfuls of vegetables with lots of colour. Uh, the more the better. Even, you know, if you're having tomatoes, well, you can get different coloured tomatoes. Capsicums, you can get different coloured capsicums and your carrots and get all that rainbow happening and see where you look around your fruit and veg section and, well, what have I not got in my basket that I can actually start to introduce? A quarter of the plate it represents your protein. Now, if you do have animal protein, 
one palm is what you are looking at. If you don't have animal protein, you need two palms. As far as starchy stuff go, and there's a whole other discussion about carbs and the evils of carbs, and you know what, carbs aren't always evil, but ratio of carbs is important. So here we look at how much is she talking about. Now she's looking at, looking at whole grains, as mentioned before, looking at quinoa, perhaps brown rice and starchy vegetables, and her all time favorite would be, uh, and my favorite, would be sweet potato as opposed to our normal potato. So you've got a few choices there. Lastly, we actually need fat. And you're allowed to have a good thumbful of fat. So fat is one that um, has really been um, hammered, particularly sort of over the 80s onwards, um, and particularly in terms of heart health, that you've got to reduce your saturated fats. But not all fats are bad, and Fats can actually be really important as a flavour carrier. So anyone who is into their cooking, they would know that. Um, my husband loves to do the French thing and add a little bit of butter. That would probably make Lisa not so happy. She would probably talk about co coconut oil. But a fabulous fat, for example, is avocado. And having that as avocado. So if you want to know more about the depth of kind of food, that is something you could talk to Lisa about. And you could also look into the program that we're talking about a little bit later. So I hope that gives you just a little bit of gold for you to talk about um, how you could do a few things differently with your plate ratio. And how many plates should you have a day? Well, obviously three is important, but if you're also training, you might need a little bit more than that. Lisa wanted to also share with us that the benefits of an ideal meal. And the benefits of an ideal meal, she lists as this. It allows you to have a slow and steady release of energy across a period of time. And getting those ratios right makes a difference in how our digestive system works through it and how quickly it breaks different things down for energy release. So some are a faster release, some are a slower release. Eating that way also helps in decreasing inflammation. It avoids the high and lows of sugar spikes and it also helps brain performance. Our brains need to have a certain amount of energy. We think about um, energy as to sort of going to our body only, but our nervous system must have that energy. Otherwise, we start to fade. We don't concentrate quite as well. And we've all probably experienced that sometimes we might, you know, may or may not have some breakfast and you get to the sort of half past 10 times and you're, or you're looking for something to sort of give you a lift. You might even have lunch, but you might find that come about three or four o'clock time, you sort of have another low and you're looking for something to give you a lift. And unfortunately, we often grab something that's not, not necessarily bad for us. So the question might be, what are you having in those meals? Have they got the right ratio of food to actually give you more sustained energy? Um, our body needs energy for good movement, and we're going to talk about movement in a little while. And also, Lisa would say that that kind of eating really matches our evolutionary gut structure. It's what I like our gut generally for all people, but for most people will appreciate. Now, some people may have issues with certain foods and certainly you need to seek more help with that. Um, and someone like Lisa, who is trained in nutrition, is someone who can help you as in addition to maybe consulting with medical people as well. There's nothing wrong with having a team of people help you with work issues. Okay, so let's talk about the next leg of the table. The next pillar is about moving well. So being a chiropractor, this is my bread and butter. People come to me when they get to a point where they either can't move anymore or they're not moving well. And I tell you, I don't know what's been in the water the last few weeks, but I've a number of people presenting in, in, in quite a bad way. They've left things so long or they haven't been listening to their body for a long time or they've put things off and their body is literally screaming at them. Um, and of course, they want to be fixed straight away. But the reality is it takes time to figure out what is contributing to the movement problem? What has been injured? What has got any wear and tear? And then what do we need to do to actually work on that over a period of time? Very rarely is there a miracle cure, a miracle adjustment, a miracle massage or something that just makes everything better. It takes time for your body to respond. Now we, as evolutionary wise, were designed to be dynamic beings. We are not designed to just be still. Every aspect of our body depends on movement. Every tissue of our body depends on movement. All our organs depend on movement. So, for example, the lymphatic system. 
which not many of you may, may know much about. You sort of, we know a lot about the circulatory system, but the lymphatic system is one that actually drains fluid from our tissues and then it gets processed. So for our, our lymphatic system to work properly, it actually depends on regular movement and muscular movement to get those fluids moving. So I guess a good analogy of that is for if you've been on a plane when you're in a pressurized cavern and you're actually not moving very much, we know that swelling can occur and of course that can put you at risk for DBTs, but that's because you've not got any muscular movement to assist the circulation, be it the traditional blood circulation system or the lymphatic system. So we must move. Um, to be static is to promote ill health. And if we are still, and I'm not talking about, about meditation, be still for a period of time, I'm talking about lack of movement, sedentary lifestyles, which we know all about. Um, that has been linked, sitting has been linked to an increase in poor health and a likelihood of death through um, development of chronic diseases. I was uh, speaking to my daughter about this um, the other day and talking about movement. I actually took her through this little workshop. Uh, I used it as an excuse to do a test run, but also I'm trying to plant seeds in my daughter's head about healthy principles because while I'm a chiropractor and I know this stuff, I'm also her mum and why would she listen to me? But I was trying to explain to her um, and maybe it's because she's not been on this earth long enough, the difference between, you know, if you're out camping, would you go drink from a, a still pond that was sort of stagnant water or would you go and try and get water from a, a running little little bit of river or a little bit of a creek? And she's like, oh, I'm going to the pond. And I thought, oh, my God, she's going to die if I let her out there. But when I asked this question of people in the workshop, by and large, they all oh, know, yes, you've got a you know, healthy water is water that is flowing. So a healthy body is one that has flow in it. Movement is life. If you are super still, if nothing is moving, people are going to think you're dead. And really, you are. And that just doesn't come from physical observable movement. That's how they used to check, you know, is someone actually breathing? Is there a breath on the glass? We now know that to be truly dead is when you are brain dead. And there is no detectable electronic pulse in your system. It's off. Nothing is firing. That is movement as well, or lack of movement as well. We also know from research is that when you are sitting a lot of the time, and unfortunately so many people have jobs that they are required to sit for long periods of time, they are more likely to have an increase in inflammation. And that is true also for something as simple as um, a lower back complaint. So in days of old, people uh, were told that if you, know, if you did your back, if you did a disc, you needed to go to bed for six to eight weeks and then you'd be right. But research has now showed that's anything but true. And while there might be periods you need to rest, the longer that you are still, the more that inflammatory fluid builds up. And when that inflammatory fluid builds up, it is just amazingly painful to move. Some people might experience, um, you know, when they get up in the morning, they're feeling really stiff and sore, but once they get going again, and that's because if there's any residual low-grade inflammation, once you get moving comfortably, that helps things flow and some of that inflammatory product is, is dispersed and taken away. So movement's a big thing. Moving well is a big thing. We can talk a lot more about posture. I talk about posture all the time. So there is ideal movement, this ideal position that we should be in. And in fact, your posture and your initial neutral position will determine your normal movement patterns. And so many people I see are not coming here as a result of a specific one-off injury and they've just done it. More often than not, their presentation and their movement and their posture is an accumulation of bad things that have snuck up on them over a very long period of time or old injuries that have haven't properly healed. And so the movement patterns have got to a point where their bodies can't compensate anymore and they're having episodes that they need help with. So let's talk about what happens if we don't move well. We get stiff. We know that if we've been in a car for a long period of time, driving between here and Mount Gambia, for example, are you going to be stiff when you get out? Um, tissues and joints actually need normal movement to actually keep things lubricated. So in all, just about all of the joints of our body, we have bone surface, we have um, cartilage and we have lubrication fluid and then that's all encapsulated. So for that cartilage to stay healthy, we need that fluid moving all the time. If it gets static, technically, if things aren't moving, they still and they dry up. The same thing will happen with the discs of our spine and the discs in between our spinal bones, they actually don't have their own blood supply. They, 
and therefore they, they don't heal well if they're damaged, but they are dependent on the two, that joint complex, the two bones moving in a normal way to imbibe the nutrients in the fluid around in that disc. So poor movement means that that disc doesn't get the nutrients it needs and it leads to deterioration of that disc over time. So again, good, good spinal movement and movement in, in total is important. So that's why we tell you to get up from sitting regularly. With that, um, I remember many years ago in a tutorial, one of my lecturers said, aging is tightening, Paula. And I was probably about 21, 20 at the time. And I'm like, yeah, right, you know. And, you know, he was 40 and he's like, oh, I looked after people for a while. It's true. Okay, I'm 46 now. And, yeah, ageing is tightening. Our tissues do change and age over our lifetime. But the more immobile we are and the more sedentary we are, we actually lose resistance. We lose elasticity. Hence the expression, move it or lose it. We are, therefore, more prone to injury if we don't move well. And the most important thing here is that our nervous system function does not work properly and it actually declines in its function if we're not moving. So a whole swag of reasons why we need to get moving. So let's now move on to our next slide. I'll just see if I can do the share thing so you can see where I'm up to. So thinking and mindset, this is a really big issue. And um, I'm looking today, I just recorded an interview for our uh, 40 Day Flip program with a colleague who specializes in thought patterns and trying to change them. So I remember being taught by one of my mentors about um, thoughts being things. And uh, this was much younger in my career. And um, as all people do, you are developing, you're trying to increase your confidence, you're trying to increase better. And I had stuff that was happening in my life. And she did point out to me that, you know, how much of this are you manifesting? Are you controlling? If you're getting a bit wound up, realize that that is internal and you maybe have the chance to kind of slow that down. So I will preface it here by saying, I'm not someone who is trained in psychology, although I did a little bit of psychology in uni, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm just speaking as a normal everyday person who thinks about how they think. So thoughts are things, and my question to you is who actually controls your thoughts? And that's a really interesting thing. What are the internal um, things that influence us and what are the external things that influence us? So we could talk about, uh, we could talk about your people in your life that are most influential. So again, one of my uh, former coaches and mentors, he, he was American and he used to talk about mother, father, teach, preacher, which is probably a very American thing to do. But he talked about a lot of those people in our formative years can shape our thought process. So I asked the, um, the room last night about all the various people that had influence in their life. And the, the answers were really interesting. There was uh, people who said, yes, probably my mum and my dad. There was someone else who said, oh, I, had, I had some cousins that, um, particularly when I was adolescent, they had a big influence in me. Someone else was talking about a teacher that they had that really just, uh, I suppose, inspired them to go beyond what was the, the normal culture in her family and, and achieve some goals. So those things can be really positive or maybe not so positive. Who plants those seeds in your brain that you either latch onto and then you absorb and take on board that can shape your belief about yourself? But aside from that, you may have developed your own beliefs, your own value systems. And what we were talking about earlier in um, trying to look at habit change is that it's knowing that if we have um, strong values or strong beliefs and they are in the direction of change that we're wanting to make, that we are more likely to actually achieve those changes. So if you're thinking about that you want to make some change, really sort of do a little bit of an order on yourself. So why do I think like that and why do I want those changes and why is that important to me? There's a very famous uh, Henry Ford quote, which is, um, if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're probably right. And uh, I think basically he was trying to say that your attitude about things will affect the outcomes of those things too. So not often do we stop and assess our thoughts and actually pay attention to our thoughts. If you need to be uh, looking into that a little bit more or you need some help, make sure you go ask for help. So I'm just going to share the next slide with you, which is all about 
Well, I wonder if you can guess what it's about. I showed this to my daughter. I said, hey, would you want to be that fish? She's like, oh, well, oh no way. I'd be a very worried fish. So really, our next, our next topic is to talk about stress. We, we can't talk about how we think without acknowledging that stress um, plays a part in this. So I've got a whole other workshop discussing understanding and managing stress. Um, but this is just a, a very quick snapshot about how stress is handled and how it's managed within our body. So first of all, stress can be classified as positive or negative or eustress or de-stress. And essentially, there are three basic stages to stress. First of all, we have to notice that there are stress. Our brain goes, <gasps> central nervous system, okay, there's something going on. The, the alarm is raised. There is the awareness. We then have to mount a response to that stress. And there's varied responses we can have. And so we mount some sort of resistance. And then while we're doing the thing to deal with this stress, there does come a point where we can't seem to keep responding. There's an exhaustion point that occurs. So there's these three different stages and you probably can relate to that somewhat. So just going to um, share my screen again. So if we look at what happens in our body, um, and this is a little bit of chiropractic 101, this is about how the nerve system works. So everything, the central nervous system in our brain uh, is our brain, and of course, everything has to be interpreted by our brain. So the brain goes, right, I've got to do something about this stress. It has to send a message by the nerve system out to the target parts of the body that have to mount that stress, that, that physical response. However, the brain needs to know something's happening and that it's being dealt with. So the information has to go back up the chain, back to the central nervous system again and say, right, this is what we're doing. So what really is occurring, and there's part of our nerve system that deals with this, and you may have heard of the sympathetic nerve system. Now, the sympathetic nerve system is not ooh, crying sympathetic. It's just the name it's given. And it is the part that helps mount the response to the stress. And basically, there's three ways it's going to go. You're either going to fight, you're either going to have a fright and run away or you're going to freeze. And it's probably in more uh, recent times that people have acknowledged that freeze is a, is a stress response. One of those three things. Now, in, um, in ancient days when we were being chased by tigers, it's fully understandable, the fight or flight. The freeze, well, you're probably going to be eaten if you freeze or a strategy of play dead. But in our modern lives, that acute stress, our bodies create... Um, uh, adrenal glands release adrenaline and you've heard of that before and that is the one that is used for more short-term periods of stress when we're talking about longer term periods of stress there's a different hormone called cortisol and cortisol props up our systems and shuts other ones down so the priority is dealing with the stress and that is how people keep going and going and going for a long period of time however there is a time where the body realizes that the stress has gone or there's a crisis and there's a fatigue point. So I don't know if you've ever known anyone who has uh, gone on holiday and all of a sudden they've been looking forward to this holiday and when they go on holiday, they get sick. Um, and certainly across my years, I have had plenty of people in that situation. And very classically, I see teachers who've been going hell for leather, particularly at the end of the term. And then the holidays come, they finally get to wind down and they hit a bit of a wall. So that's a very common denominator. You may have had that happen yourself. And our bodies are designed to then pause and start to recuperate. Now, sometimes with the stress response, things can go wrong. So I'll just bring my little um, uh, screen up again. Bear with me. It takes a little bit to flip between these two. So the nerve interference issue, and again, this is something that I see and use and do every day. So we can have situations where that beautiful chain of information between our brain and our body and then messages from our body back up to our brain can be interfered with. And as chiropractor, one of the things we see and deal with all the time is when that point of the information coming down the central canal and out via nerve root can get disturbed through a vertebral subluxation, a, something in your spine that's not moving well. And so my job is to try and establish better movement so that that flow of information actually happens better between brain and body. So that's the part that chiropractors play. However, there are things that you can do to start to bring up the other side 
once the stress has stopped or you've hit that exhaustion point, obviously your nervous system needs to start to switch on recovery. So now we're actually going to talk about the next leg of the table, the recovery part. So sleep and recovery. There's a very, very um, famous TED talk um, called Sleep is Your Superpower. And I got to watch it. I'd only come across it last year. Um, and it quotes so much amazing material. I think it's best, I don't try to quote it, but you just simply plug in and have a look at it. There are so many systems of our body that are adversely affected by chronic sleep debt. And really, that is when our body is supposed to heal. So I talked about the sympathetic part of the nerve system, which is stimulated uh, in response to stress. The other side is the parasympathetic, and the parasympathetic is all about rest, digest and recovery and basically giving your body a chance to build up that resilience again so it can be ready to fight another day you know as humans we um we look we trash ourselves we keep pushing ourselves and we're not sometimes really not good at listening to when our body is asking for a pause and asking for a recovery point so our body goes right well i'll, I'll teach you and i'll boom knock you for six and something more serious happens that really does make you stop and um, sleep is one of the most important ways of trying to regenerate. So having been a mother of young children and twins, sleep deprivation happened in my household, and I'm certainly sure it's happened in many other households and you might be going through it. But coming through the other side of when children finally sleep a bit better, I realized how much sleep was more important to me. And I have had to really make an effort to change some of my sleep habits. Being a student, I tended to be a bit of a night owl. Clearly, when I got pregnant, that wasn't possible anymore. I had to actually teach myself to go to bed earlier. But of course, as I've moved back into a more normal uh, life pattern with children who do sleep through the night, I was finding that, that that habit of staying up late was happening again. And of course, waking up at a, with a chronic sleep debt. So what are some things I've learned that there is an ideal period of sleep time, which is between 10 p.m. and about 6 a.m. in the morning. That is the primo time for our whole body to regenerate. There are hormones that are made only when you sleep. In fact, growth hormone is really only made when you sleep and that's why it's so important for kids. But we also need that as adults, even though we've technically stopped growing in height, our body might be growing in other ways. So sleep, oh please, just try your best to try and get yourself to bed a little bit earlier. I'm a great fatter. I might say I'm going to go to bed at this time, but actually takes me a lot of mucking around before I actually get head on pillow, lights out. Okay, I'm now going into sleep mode. We have these uh, beautiful devices that have come into our lives in such a huge way. And of course, that means that we, if we're watching those and then we're watching those and we're taking them to bed and we've got them by the side of the table, we may not be actually switching off. And there's a lot of research to talk about the stimulation of that, the light in particular, and the difference it makes to helping our bodies get into a better sleep zone. Sleep, however, is not the only way of um, getting recovery time. Um, in fact, even if you did get that sleep, our bodies aren't really designed to just be asleep, recover, and then be going into the sympathetic dominance the whole time, just go, 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 go. That still can create a sleep debt because you're not getting enough regeneration apart from your sleep. So non-sleep ways of regenerating that might vary a great deal. And I wonder, do you allow for that in your life? Some people are fabulous at meditation. I'm not. Some people now look at mindfulness. Some people might pray. Some people might read. Some people might listen to music. Um, whatever it is, do you actually have that as part of your life, apart from your sleep time, quiet time? I have found that uh, in recent years where I used to always have the radio on, always used to listen to something, there are times when I'm in the car and I'm by myself, which is a novelty and I haven't got kids asking me questions, that I just had 10, 15 minutes of just quiet and all I'm going to do is concentrate and drive. And that's quite unique. I wouldn't say it's the best way of doing it, but just switching off some of that stimulation has actually been really helpful to me. Okay, so... We sort of come to a bit of the end of the four table legs, the four pillars of health, and we've talked about different things that we can do. So this is the summary point where we talk about, okay, so you want to try and um, achieve some healthier habits. My top things are, you know what? Describe your reason why. Make sure you know why you want to make that change. Make sure you've got a support system around you, a nice team who is going to go, yeah, good on. It might just be one person in your life. 
doesn't matter. Just someone to go, heads up, you're doing well. Do you need any help? Pat you on the back. Set your goals very smartly with the, uh, the extra things. So smart was specific, measurable, achievable, accountable, um, relevant, and time-based. Also, if, if anything from tonight, you could actually take one thing from each area we've talked about, about food, one thing about movement, one thing about attitude and your thought patterns, one thing about sleep and rest and recovery, and you just did those, those four one things and you were able to keep that up, I think that would be astounding. I think you'd really notice some change over the, la over the um, uh, next few months in particular. So if you would indulge me, I just want to share with you a very special program that uh, has been cooking away for a while, and Lisa and I and, and Dr. Ashley is also contributing, that we have come up with something called the 40 Day Flip. So I just want to share a little bit with you about what that is in here in the clinic. So um, we'll be soon sending out some information to any of those who are interested, and if you want to know a little bit of information, just let me know. We know that changing habits actually can be really hard. We touched on some of those things today. So we thought, what if we designed a program to help make that a bit easier? So we've designed a 40-day program that you can register for and participate in. And it means that you do, over these 40 days, some of the guidelines that we have suggested. But not, that's not the only thing. We're going to create a private Facebook group that you can be a part of. And we're going to delight, uh, deliver some online content to you, some video content to you, that you can sit and listen and learn. And that will help deepen your understanding of why we have the guidelines in the program that we do. I'm, I'm very strong on the fact that I don't think that you want to just, you know, be ideal for 40 days and then you go back to all your bad habits and you unwind and then you're back where you started. You know, the whole, you know, 12 week transformational program, you know, just do this and do this and do this and do this and be a soldier and do everything you're told to do without thinking about how can you integrate that into your life in a really pragmatic way. Many of you are probably really busy. You're probably parents and running families, and it's hard to do all of those things. But learning a little bit and integrating a little bit and then keeping it up and getting encouraged is perhaps a more successful way of doing it. So if that's something you want to participate in, what will you actually get? You'll get a nutrition plan spelling out the kind of things that we want you to eat and uh, the kind of foods that we're going to suggest you start to incorporate into your life. We're going to give you some recipe ideas and tips. We're going to give you some ideas about physical training in different ways that you can sort of get uh, more efficient um, outcomes from the time that you do put into it. We're going to try and talk about the things that might help start to shape your attitudes. And as I mentioned earlier, I was really lucky to interview someone earlier today who is uh, going to feature in that program to give you some uh, ideas about that. In doing that, you'll probably learn how to recover and heal better by listening to your body and actually programming that downtime. So I'm all for very pragmatic strategies. I'm for very um, uh, easy strategies that you can actually sustain. And, you know, if you are in a household that you have other people you've got to manage as well, maybe you can get other people doing those things. If you're only responsible for yourself, you might find it easier to sort of put some things in place and actually keep them up over a period of time. So thank you for your attention today. I hope the technology has actually worked. I'll find out in due course. And if you would like to know more about the 40 Day Flip program, please make contact with us. We will be launching very soon. It does start on the 1st of March, which is not far away. Um, and you can register your interest. It's not gonna cost as much as what you think, but this is our first time running the program, so we will have a special offer for you to participate in. So thank you very much for uh, your attention for the last hour or so, and I hope that you've got something out of today, and I'll talk to you real soon.